Taylor Decker's on my all 22 fantasy team, by the way. Stop. Stop it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Taylor's I don't care, and I'm in the league. I'm just trying to hype up the future of fantasy football here. <clears throat> they told me we could hype it up. Nobody cares about your fantasy team. That's one of the uh, cardinal my rules way. of broadcasting. Regardless of the medium, they don't care. So the strategic component to this game is through the roof. Go, go, your go, predictions, go. right? Your forecasting in fantasy football into how good is this player? This is gonna, it's gonna change the industry. Yeah, yeah. I moved to the old town with goals down. Look at me now. I wrote my goals down. I hold it down. Made myself proud. Say, look at me now. Welcome into the All 22 podcast. I am Chris Lombardi and I'm joined by Ray Cotto. Uh, Ray, there was some really big news yesterday about Aaron Rodgers, but I am going to ask that we wait to talk about it until tomorrow. <laughs> we have uh, tomorrow we're going to be doing our mock draft, and I think it makes a little more sense to talk about it in that conversation. And also, I think the, the wounds are still fresh for me, so I need time to heal a little bit before I can really talk about it. You good with that? You're such a baby. Uh, I, I told you you should have just ripped the bandit off the 2021 draft night instead, but here you guys are two two years later, better, better late than ever, I guess, huh? Listen, man, when you're like semi-pro bowl quarterback Tony Romo retired, I, you were like down and out for a year, so relax. Semi-pro bowl Tony Romo. Okay, that's that's interesting. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway. All right. All right, so let's do our defensive rankings by position. Uh, on offense, we started from like the ball out. So I think we should do the same thing. Let's start with defensive interior. Give me your top five. Yeah. All right. Number one's probably no surprise. Uh, Jalen Carter, I think by far number one, probably the best player in the draft when talking about pure players, right? Obviously there's a lot going on uh, off the field there that needs to be sorted out, but Jalen Carter, number one, two, I have Mozzie Smith. Uh, three, I have 2021 Brian Bressey. Uh, four, I have Kalijah Kansi. And five, Adetamiwa Adeboware out of uh, Northwestern. I'm trying to like write these down so that I could like just you know make sure I know what I'm talking about. And then you said Adeboware, and I'm not going to be able to spell that. So, <laughs> Big but okay. Uh, Jalen Carter is my number one. I have Kalijah Kansi at two. I have Brian Bressey at three, and I'm not going to pull some contingency crap like you did. I have Mozzie Smith at four, and I have Sayaki Ikea at five. So a little bit different. Um, I guess Mozzie Smith is probably the biggest difference. Uh, So tell me why you have him at two over guys like Kansi and Brisse. The more you look at defensive tackles, the more you see that there are very few human beings out there with one tech size and three tech athleticism. And he's pretty much the closest thing to it in this class. Uh, And yeah, I think he just fills that role and has the ability that others in this class simply don't big, big tackle that moves a little bit like he's a little bit smaller than he actually is. And that's, that's pretty rare. And I'm just a big fan. Okay. I feel like I have pretty good defense on this one. So I'm going to kind of use your words, throw them in your face a little bit here, because typically you go for guys with that high end upside because you really like that. Like you're a big fan of taking a risk on a guy with high upside, even if his floor might be much lower and you're going and putting Mozzie Smith as your number two, who I think has a pretty high floor, but might be limited in what his ceiling is above guys like Canty and Brisse. What I would say is I agree with, taking the safe approach for positions where guys are on the field every snap, right? When we're talking about offensive tackle, when we're talking about quarterback, when we're talking about, uh, I don't know, corner. But when we're talking about defensive interior, where they shuffle those guys around a lot, and a lot of them aren't asked to be every down players, I think I prefer taking a risk on a guy with one elite trait, like a Kansi with his speed, right? So I think that's why I have those guys a little bit higher. If Cansey was as effective on first and 10 with 14 minutes and 50 seconds left in the first quarter as he is in the fourth, or rather if he was as effective in the fourth as he is in the first, then yeah, I'd probably have him a little higher. But I don't know if if, if you're wearing down towards the end of college games, I'm a little worried about what you're going to do uh, when you're facing grown men more than 25 times a game. 
Right. Well, well, we'll see. But okay, so your yeah. number five, you had Adebowari, and I had Sayaki Ikea. Um, I like Ikea similar to why you like Mozzie Smith. I think he can be potentially the same kind of player, um, maybe not as high of an upside or as, as high of a floor, but a really solid player that can do everything well. Um, I liked his strength. I liked his, uh, his ability to move people around at, the, at his own will. Uh, I like those things about him. What did you like about Adebowari that you had him as your fifth? Yeah, so totally different type of player, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, we're talking six, what's under six two and two eighty uh, versus someone like uh, Siaki, who's like three fifty plus or something like that, right? So two totally different flavors of ice cream there. But um, for Adebowale, I mean, simply put, he's just a short, explosive playmaker. He's going to be a just a pain in the ass pretty much for whoever goes against him because of how low and quick he is. Um, he's very explosive linearly. I wanted to put him higher and I, I was a little frustrated because I expected a more smooth player on tape and he's not quite that every short explosive, uh, defensive lineman gets compared to Aaron Donald in one way or another. But the thing that separates Aaron Donald is how fluid of an athlete he is. And Adam Bawari is not that. And that's why he is only fifth on this list because he does have a little more stiffness to him and to his game, but he is quick and linear. So it's really just a flavor of ice cream, right? You're talking, which one do you want? Sort of the, the, the pesky sort of uh, penetrator or, or what projects to be a penetrator in Adebowale versus that big one tech in, in Siaki Ika, if you're saying that correctly. I'm definitely not, but okay. I agree with you. Um, I have Adebowari at seven on my list. Uh, I like a lot of what he does, but I didn't see him win in ways that I think will translate. Uh, but he he has the opportunity to be a good NFL football player. But let's move to Edge because we're oh sorry, real quick. Who do you have at six? Uh, Benton. Oh, okay, interesting. So I had Gervon Dexter real quick. If I'm saying that correctly, I just want to point him out too because I I'm I'm intrigued by him. Uh, the long and short of him is he's big. He's not, he's not sloppy, right? He's not fat. He carries his weight. Well, uh, he's long and he's nimble. So I like those traits to start as a foundation and, uh, he gives opposing linemen fits, but I think the issue with him and why he's not top five, because he's kind of got that profile. I like at like six, five, three, 10 with long arms and, and good length and all that, but he wins reps, but doesn't finish plays. So he's not higher on the list for me, but he's not someone who I would be shocked by if three or four years from now he's doing better than most. Okay. Maybe I'll need to go back and watch some of him, but give me your five edge rushers. Uh, This is so tough. Uh, I have Will Anderson at one. At second, I have Nolan Smith. Third, I have Tyree Wilson. Fourth, Miles Murphy. And fifth is Will McDonald. All right. So my one was Anderson. My two was Miles Murphy. Three was Nolan Smith. Four was Tyree Wilson. And five was Lucas Van Ness. So I want to know why you have Tyree Wilson above a guy like Miles Murphy. He's so, the profile's great. He's, he has such good length. And I just, I just think he can be an absolute menace to offensive tackles once he get some polish. He is not polished. He's a big 12 defender. I don't know. I'm not sure if any of them really are, but he's, he's so, he's so unpolished, but has just so much potential is just oozing with it. The sentence that I kind of ended Gervon Dexter's uh, section with, as far as he wins a lot of reps, but doesn't finish the plays. Tyree Wilson just wins so many reps that I, I see him being so disruptive once he just kind of gets a little more coaching and just a little comfortable in his own skin and sort of adds to his toolbox in the NFL that I have him at three. I, I like Murphy a lot, but um, yeah, I just, I'm a big fan of what Wilson can do. So one thing I struggled with when evaluating this year's class is I think there's a lot of prospects unlike other years where these guys are going to take time to develop. Like I think a guy like Tyree Wilson like you're saying, might have insane upside. It might be great three years down the road. I just think it's going to take time to get there, right? And 
do I want to bet on that? That's kind of the thing I struggled with. Like, do I want to bet on that as opposed to where I think Miles Murphy, Nolan Smith, Will Anderson might give you more success in year one, right? Like they have a more developed game. They have more ways to win. Um, and that's that's the thing really at the end of the day that I struggled with. But I think the conversation around edge is this is probably the deepest edge class we've seen we've seen ever. Um, it's, it's a great class and topped with a guy like Will Anderson, who we think is maybe not elite, maybe not a blue chip, but he's right under that. He's a really solid player that's going to be good for, for a long time. Um, you have Will McDonald at your five. I didn't have him in my top five. I actually had him at seven, but I'm curious why, again, you kind of had him over a guy like a Lucas Van Ness. I think if Will McDonald was used as a primary just edge rusher, mm -hmm. I think he would be higher on a lot of people's radar. Um, I actually get frustrated because the Big 12 does this all the time. I saw this with defensive linemen from Oklahoma for years. Um, they they move Will McDonald around too much. And whenever he just lined up at edge, he just beat the hell out of people. It was just that simple. When he lined up at edge, he was so effective as a rusher and so disruptive that you wondered why they didn't keep him there. They just, they, I guess it's, it's their defensive scheme over there or, or what have you. I mean, I'm not going to act like I know more than they do, but whenever he was at edge, he was the best player on the field constantly. And I just, whenever I watched his tape, I was like, okay, I want to see more of him at edge. And they didn't put him there. So is it a little bit of a projection? I guess, but his tape as primarily an edge rusher, which he will be in the league was phenomenal. His, his base of skill sets might be the best of the group. Like he has this base of really great skills that some of the other guys don't. Um, his frame kind of worries me. He's, he's thin. He's, he's not that perfect size guy with, and, and because he doesn't, he doesn't have Nolan Smith speed, right? Like Nolan Smith is this crazy athlete. Um, Miles Murphy has the size and speed. Will Anderson is just the most developed, has the size and speed. Tyree Wilson, obviously the perfect frame, but I think Lucas Van Ness also has this perfect frame that you want in an edge rusher, but he doesn't have that base of skill sets that Will McDonald does. So I, I can completely understand shuffling those guys around. Um, I think Van Ness has to develop a lot more with what he does. I think, you know, being just a, I'm going to run you over power edge rusher isn't really going to work in the NFL against some of the more developed offensive tackles that he's going to face. Uh, but, I, but I like his frame a lot. I like his frame a lot. So do I have him over a guy like Will McDonald? Yes. But again, I think Van Ness, Foskey, McDonald, there, there might even be a couple other guys you want to mention, but there's, there's a group of guys kind of after that first tier that I think are still really good starters in the NFL. Yeah. Great, great class. It doesn't have a Miles Garrett, but it has pretty much everything else at edge. So I'm a big fan of it. Was there anybody else you wanted to mention? Uh, I mean, someone that's off the radar, I might've mentioned him in a previous episode. It's not necessarily someone that just missed out on my top five, but I'm still so intrigued by Zach Harrison. Um, uh, his, his athletic skill set is off the charts and that of the elite pass rushers that have come into the league, uh, not so often, but the question about physicality and and uh, the technical aspects of his game, he never really put it all together, but that's just a name that just intrigues me that I wouldn't be surprised goes in the first half of day two just because of his uh, physical skill set. I'm not sure I would bet on him that high, but that's another really intriguing name is Zach Harrison, the edge out of Ohio State. Love that. And then, I mean, Andre Carter, we spoke about a, a bit, Ooh, yep. just being this guy that like, we don't really know what he is. People had him really high on their draft boards. Some people have him completely off. I think we spoke about just like, is he even rosterable at this point? I don't know, but he could also show up now that he's kind of like in NFL mode where he gains 25 pounds or 30 pounds of muscle and he becomes this more complete build of an edge rusher we see in the NFL. So I think he's a guy to keep an eye on if he does kind of start to transform his body. But until that happens, yeah, I think he's kind of, Good to be left off of these lists. Yeah. Let's move to linebacker. Oh man, linebacker was linebacker was a little tough. Uh, number one, I have Drew Sanders. At two, I have Deion Henley. At three, I have uh, Jack Campbell. Fourth, I have Dorian Williams out of Tulane. 
And fifth, I have Owen Popoe out of uh, Auburn. Okay. So any answer that doesn't have Captain Jack Campbell as number one is just wrong. So uh, I'm going to start there. Uh, Captain Jack Campbell is the number one on my list. I had Trenton Simpson as my number two. Demervion Overshawn as my number three. Drew Sanders at four. And Diane, Diane Henley at five. So very different lists here. Very, very different lists. Yeah. So H- Sanders, you have as your number one. We spoke about him and Jack Campbell on a daily, so we don't have to go in depth. But how do you justify putting a guy that doesn't really have linebacker, that all that much linebacker <laughs> experience at the top of your list? I think that's why. I, I, so th- with Sanders, it, it was as simple as his ability to rush the passer just was basically the tiebreaker because between Sanders, Henley, and Campbell – they're all different types of linebackers, right? You got the coverage guy in Henley. You got Campbell, who's sort of the bigger guy, who's more of the the, the do it all type. And then Sanders is sort of the the upside, uh, inexperienced, but uh, pass rusher of the group. And so I was like, okay, this it's it's literally vanilla strawberry chocolate. Just which one do you like more? And I mean, it's a passing league. And so I said, I, I kind of like the upside of the pass rusher in that sense. But I mean. Yeah, I could have shuffled them all in in any direction. Uh, those three, and it, you know, I wouldn't argue with it if you had those three any differently. I guess I'd say. So Campbell, it's I never talked about this because I didn't want to blow what he did out of proportion. But when you look at his box against South Dakota goals, State or whatever it was, yeah, relax yourself. When you look <laughs> at his comparables on the mock draftables board, right? Every single one of the top guys that compare his body size and athletic profile to or edge rushers. And I didn't want to talk about that because I didn't see it on tape enough, but you're looking at like a 75.6 match to Khalil Mack, right? So I think that Iowa did not use Campbell in that regard, but he could be used as an edge rusher in the NFL if a team wanted to, because he has the size, right? He's 6'5". He's 250 pounds. Like he's bigger than Nolan Smith. He's quick. His three cone was great. So I think that's a kind of overshadowed part of his game that people don't talk about being possible. Eh, you say, you say Khalil Mack, I say Leighton Van Der Esch. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I guess it could be the war, but I mean, if there's one thing I do trust that, that Iowa staff to, to get right or to do well, it's, it's defense. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of of the opinion until I see it, that it's more so that he's just simply best as a linebacker. It doesn't have any plus, pass rush traits because again yeah he has the build for it but you didn't you didn't see him really do it much on tape so I, i'm not gonna i'm not going to attribute that skill set to him without seeing it just yet if he if he ends up having it that's fantastic because yeah like he said he's defensive and sized so obviously that'd be huge if he does but got to see it okay so my two and three you do not have on your board at all so trenton simpson demarvion over sean I love these guys. I think Simpson, we talked about, right? Like I think maybe I thought of him a little too highly. He came down in my eyes a little bit, but I still have him as this really intriguing prospect with plus speed, coverage ability, uh, run stopping ability. And then over Sean, like if you want to see electric tape at linebacker, go and put his on because he is one of the most vicious hitters I've seen. He's slightly undersized, but he's a big time playmaker. So why did neither of those guys make your list? Because Simpson scares me. If if you told me three years from now that Trenton Simpson was passed over and the team that drafted him was now looking for another linebacker, I would not be surprised in the least. If you told me he was a top 20 linebacker <clears throat> three years from now, I also wouldn't be surprised. It's just so much variance there. And uh, I don't know. He, he scares me. He scares me a bit. I think it's 55-45 that... Um, he doesn't hit that ceiling just because of how fast the game, the game sort of appeared to him. So he scares me. And then as far as Overshown goes, I actually had him as my like sort of bonus. Let's talk about him player here who didn't make my top five, just because Owen Popoe is sort of the same type of player uh, as far as just run and hit super fast, super aggressive, but, a bit undersized, right? So uh, Papoe is is six foot, two hundred twenty five pounds. I really hope I'm saying that last name right. Um, and but we talk about all the time is how the league is going smaller anyway. So that doesn't really 
um, you know, scare me off that much. He's just so explosive. He's a running hit backer. He just always pops off the screen. And I like his athleticism and he kind of fits the league today. So I said, I'm not going to be a coward. I'm going to put him at number five. Okay. And then Dorian Williams at four. Yes. Dorian Williams. So similar to Popoe, but he's, he's, he's faster uh, or sorry, longer. He's got a better frame. Uh, he's long and fast. He blitzes well, has great closing speed and something that I think you'll like that, that we can relate to so well um, that based on Dane Brugler, he is young for his class. So he needs to get a bit more physical. He's a bit rough around the edges. He can kind of be pinballed around in traffic at times. Um, but he's, he's aggressive, has a great frame, has great closing speed and is a good blitzer. And after four years of college, he's still just 21 years old. Um, so I, I think that hits close to home for both of us. And I'm just a fan of his game when you put on the tape. Okay. I'll have to give him some more thought. Um, but I want to give plenty of time to this cornerback class because I think this is going to be kind of the most in-depth discussion. And I want to start it off because I want to steal your thunder. I have Emmanuel Forbes at my number one spot. I have Christian yeah. Gonzalez at two. I have Devin Witherspoon at three, Joey Porter Jr. at four, and Deontay Banks at five. So did you have the same? No, no, I didn't have the same. Um, I have Christian Gonzalez up top. I have Joey Porter Jr. at two, and then Emmanuel Forbes third. I had Deontay Banks at four, and then at five, I put a tie because I'm a coward at between, again, two totally different players, I guess, DJ Turner and Devin Witherspoon. So yeah, def definitely different from you. Um, but I, I want to hear, uh, I want to hear a lot from you first off, um, I want to hear what eventually put uh, Forbes over the top for you. And then I, I want to hear your thoughts on, on Witherspoon. Sure. I think that a lot is being made of Christian Gonzalez, Stephen Witherspoon, Joey Porter Jr. Talking about them like they are the surefire number one corners in the league. And I don't think that's the case. I think all of them have very intriguing upside. They all have bright futures. I don't think any of them are near the class of prospect that we saw in guys like Sauce, Sertan, even maybe a JC Horn, like these are not those guys in any way. I don't think any of them have that sure hit ability. Um, so when I look at this class and I say, is there a guy that I think could achieve that high level upside? There was only one guy that I watched this film and said, okay, his profile might not look like those guys. But when I watch this film and I look at his skill sets, it's the skill set of a true number one corner in the NFL. And that was Emmanuel Forbes, a guy that has the quickness of a number one corner. The guy, like you look at Tariq, uh, Tariq, oh Woolen, my gosh, yeah. Woolen from last year's class, right? Guy that kind of came out of nowhere, right? Guy that was successful in the league because of his length and his speed. And I look at Emmanuel Forbes and I say, we're going to be talking about him the same way, right? And in this year, again, there's not that sauce gardener to take to take the, 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 the uh, spotlight off of Woolen this year, it's going to be Forbes and a bunch of guys that are all in the mix, but I think Forbes could be that guy, right? He's a guy that can play some of the best zone coverage I've, I've seen on tape, like, like a guy like Sauce Gardner can. And I think because of the speed and the athleticism, we could see a lot more of the, uh, the man meaning and winning in man coverage that maybe we didn't see. I wouldn't say uh, Woolen came out of nowhere last year. I think you and I called that pretty early once, uh, once we saw him, which was like back in February, pretty early on before we started getting some hype. So, so maybe we know what we're uh, give yourself about, some credit, you know what I'm saying? but <laughs> maybe, maybe we know what we're talking about. I, maybe just a little bit. Um, <laughs> so it, you, you mentioned sort of the, the Sertan and, and, and Horn and, and some of those guys and sauce. So prior to, I guess, last year's class, I always sort of considered uh, the top two for the two previous years. So we're talking Stingley sauce, Sertan and Horn. Um, as sort of like this group of four that really stood out from the rest of the prospects in each of their classes and probably the, the couple before and uh, the one immediately thereafter. And you could kind of put them in any order you want based off of what you see. And, and you know, there, there, there could be some disagreement, but uh, they're all sort of in that same neighborhood, right? Um, I think if I were to add Christian Gonzalez to that mix, he wouldn't be out of place and wouldn't necessarily always be the fifth out of that group. 
I could see how I would like Christian Gonzalez more than JC Horn, just because he's not quite as reliant on physicality. I know that's a weird thing to say because I love physicality, but in the sense that he, you don't see the grabbing, the, the grabbiness much on tape with Gonzalez, and he's just. He's so smooth. Like it's the hips are fantastic. I'm not sure I've seen a better set of hips in transition since like Terrence Newman 18 years ago. Uh, it's 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 really impressive. I just love the way he turns and runs. Uh, is he the most physical guy in this class? No, but he's not necessarily someone that stands out on tape as someone who is so not physical that it's an issue. Um, so. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his, and that's what separated him from the rest of the class for me at number one, just because I think he checks all the boxes and his not lack of physicality, but just missing that extra sort of oomph in his in his game doesn't really impact me or, or scare me off very much. So he's he still takes the top notch for me. Um, Forbes and Porter was very close for me. I think I just chose Porter because – the length is similar, but Porter's got the bigger size and frame. So when it comes down to being, when it comes down to sort of you know muscling opposing defenders for balls downfield and things of that nature, Porter may hold up a bit better. They're both super smart players. So what Forbes sort of what separates Forbes from others in his class as far as his feel for different concepts and and things of that nature. Porter has that as well. He's got that background uh, with with his father being in the league for so long, and and you see how well coached he is. So, um, when when it came down to it, is basically Porter's got a little bit of a safer profile with with the added size there. So that's what separated two and three for me. But they're really close. They're really close. So I know what separated them. One went to Penn State. One didn't. That, that but- had nothing, absolutely <laughs> nothing, to do with it whatsoever. But when we talked about Joey Porter Jr., one thing I said is that I didn't see him finish enough. Like there are so many plays where he's in great position, but will not make a play that could be game changing, right? And that that sucks. Like I I hate seeing that. Emmanuel Forbes is the exact opposite guy, right? He finishes all of the plays. He comes away with tons of interceptions and again, game changing turnovers. Like I, I want that. I think another thing that separated Forbes from Gonzalez for me, because I agree with everything you said about Gonzalez, and he was my number one prior to, I think, a week ago, is that Gonzalez really only had one like above average year. He had one year where he stood out as this great player, but before that, it was kind of average. It was, it was kind of league average, right? Forbes has over 2,000 snaps to his name, and I'd say he has two years of well above average play and he was a three-year starter, right? So you kind of get a little more experience. We talked about his like intellect, his his instinctualness. Like he's that kind of a player. Um, but uh, okay, we can move on from Forbes. I want to hear why you had. Let, we we haven't given any spotlight to Deontay Banks, so I would love to hear what you have to say about him, and then tell me why DJ Turner made your list. Deontay Banks, uh, pretty simply put, he's fast and he's aggressive. Um, He's a bit inconsistent. He's got the tools to be up there with the first three on my list as far as athleticism goes, and he's got good size, but he can be a bit inconsistent. He he has high highs and low lows, which can scare some people at corner, no doubt about it, um, but he's he's got everything there sort of in his toolbox, and he's the aggressiveness. I've talked about it at other positions. I would prefer over aggression to the latter to, to the opposite, I guess, to, to needing to be more aggressive. So athletically pretty much checks every box, six foot, just under 200 pounds, uh, decent arm length, good hand size, uh, runs a four, three, five, 40 has good jumps. And on tape, he's not necessarily stiff at all. He's got, he's got every box checked off athletically and there's aggressiveness there. So you've got an athletic aggressive player. You can, you can mold that. I'm a big fan of that, and that scheme at Maryland is pretty tough on their corners. They play a brand of, of football and defense that really stresses their corners, and man, doesn't give them a lot of help. And I mean, it, it's really bitten them in, in in previous years because you know we're not talking a program that normally brings in the talent level of a place like Alabama or Georgia, where you can play aggressive with your defensive backs, right? But Banks held up well. Uh, in that scheme and allow them to sort of run that 
uh, pretty effectively. So I'm a, I'm a big, I wouldn't say I'm a big fan of his because there are some things that scare me in his game, right? Because like I said, it, he's a little bit of a boomer bust, but there's a lot there for corners, man. Six, six foot, nearly 200 pounds with four, three speed who can turn and run well does not, they, they don't grow on trees. Although there is a pretty good amount of them in this class. I got to say this class is, 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 is pretty good. In yeah. Before, regard. before you go to DJ Turner, that's what I was going to yeah. say is like, there are, five or six prospects in this corner class that very well a year or two from now could be the guy we're like, yep, he's, he's the number one now, but they, oh, you yeah. know, he could be sixth on this list. I think Banks has that upside. So I agree with that. Yeah. His, his tape was un- inconsistent. Um, I think his combine really saved him for me because we saw glimpses of what he could be. Could also be again, Maryland systems, not easy. Um, and it's also, you know, you're, you're a superstar on a defense without, a ton of superstars, so you're going to be asked to do a lot. Um, so they definitely relied on him a bit. But okay, DJ Turner now. Yeah, he's he's so fun. He's so fun to watch. Uh, also over aggressive. Another over aggressive corner. Uh, he's not great length, right? He's not great size. Everyone knows already about the the four two five or whatever four two nine whatever it was that he ran. Um, he's got the speed. Um, Jordan Lewis out of Michigan had similar quote unquote size, but had better length and tape for that matter, as you, as I recall. But the thing about DJ Turner is the speed is, is uncanny and the aggressiveness. It's just the two building blocks that I can work with. And he's got a penchant for making plays. He has like over 20 something, um, pass deflections in his career. So he's around the ball a lot and he's going to be a slot only player. So, he's probably not going to be matched up against guys size wise that can give him fits. Right. I think, I think given his, his, um, his position in the slot moving forward and, and defensive coordinators in the NFL, whoever, wherever he goes, he will be used in that sort of mold and role. So with that in mind, I'm sort of, uh, not too worried about the obvious flaws or limitations in his game, if you will, as it relates to matching up with bigger receivers, uh, like I would be for maybe some others. Um, and then, yeah, there's just the playmaking. It, slot corners who can make plays can be game changing. He's around the ball and he's really fast and he's aggressive. That is a recipe for making some game changing plays in the league. So while his profile is a bit hit and miss, he's not the most steady guy. There's others on his, this list with better technique and maybe more sound tape with better size to go along with it. It's just that, that knack for playmaking that I think can be a difference maker in the NFL. Cool. So you wanted to hear my Witherspoon take. So I didn't want yes. to, I don't want to rob you of that. Every other analyst that I've seen has Witherspoon, not only as their top corner, but as a top seven or eight prospect in this class. I disagree with that. It sounds like you do too. You have him even lower than I do. Uh, I still had him at three because he did have this amazing year last year. He had a 92.5 PFF coverage grade, right? So he showed this elite upside in coverage. I think he has a lot of man-to-man upside. The thing that I don't like about him is the frame and what he tries to do with that frame. So we're talking about a prospect that is 5'11", 181 pounds. So he's bottom 10% in weight. His wingspan is 73 inches. So that's bottom 18%. Uh, So it's it's just not a great frame, right? And what he does with that is he tries to be this overly physical corner who likes to hit people and comes downhill. And that's just, it's not translatable in the NFL. He's going to be coming downhill, trying to hit big running backs, much bigger than the ones he faced in college. He's going to be trying to be handsy with receivers that are so much quicker, so much more elusive and explosive than the ones he faced in, in college. And I just don't know how well that's going to translate. Do I think that he has upside and could be the number one corner of this class? Absolutely. Uh, but he was a one year kind of wonder at Illinois, um, where I think Forbes has a lot more upside, a lot more just kind of consistency to his game. I even see that with Joey Porter Jr., but I did have Witherspoon's upside above Porter. Uh, but yeah, Wild. do you disagree? Do you disagree Wild. with that? So the the way I look at at Witherspoon is he sort of profiles as a cover two corner physically, and I think I think he's he's more fit for the game 
and what the game was in 2005 than it is now in 2023. I, I struggle to see the upside that a lot of others do, even when he, even the, the, the top plays on his film, right. And people turn to the turnovers and things of that nature. A lot of them were just Johnny on the spot plays that were kind of thrown at him. And I was like, it was more so very poor throws by a quarterback than anything that Witherspoon did to make a play. And then there's other plays that more so it's downfield where he doesn't, he doesn't maintain his, his, uh, his stickiness. If you will. He doesn't stay in phase downfield nearly as well as I would like to see, or would expect to see from a top three corner in the class. There are times where he's giving up separation downfield and the ball just wasn't released or you know, maybe the quarterback was on the ground by that point or whatever the case was, but he looked vulnerable downfield. And I don't like that for a corner who again has, um, you know, length as a question mark, doesn't have a big frame and then you go and then you watch a tape and what will make you feel good after that, right? Three pays later is that he'll come up and thump somebody. I mean, cool. Congrats. I, I don't, I don't, we don't pay corners in the NFL to, to thump, you know, grown men. We pay them to, to cover players and, and make plays downfield and things. And, and he just doesn't do that to me. He's a cover two corner in a league where that skill set is no longer at a premium. Um, and the, 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 the upside athletically, as far as frame goes and everything is just not there. He's the type of corner that I look at and I'm not a fan of, and I just don't see how I could be wrong, but I don't see how pretty much if he's successful in the NFL, he's not doing it as someone who lines up against top receivers in the NFL and just covers them effectively for three hours every Sunday. That's not going to be his game. If he's effective, it's because they're using him as, as sort of a press cover two type corner who roams a little bit and maybe gets his hands on some footballs and then uh, is a supporter in the run game, which to me is pretty much the least valuable of the valuable traits in a corner. So a lot of people like him a lot, I guess. I, and and I, I, I don't see it. I, I don't see it there have to disagree with one thing because the first time I watch him, I really like him, right? Because there's that caveman part of my brain that sees somebody hit somebody and, and just loves it, right? But the more developed part of my brain goes, what else is he doing that will translate? And that's where it starts to come in and be like, okay, no, that's, this isn't a guy that I would put my name on as the number one corner. Um, okay, let's move to safety. Give me your top five safeties. Oh my gosh. Uh, safety's so tough. I I almost said, let's just leave it off, but I, yeah, no, I changed my mind. <laughs> Can't do that. But I had Jordan battle at number one. I had Antonio Johnson at number two. I had Jair Brown at number three, Brian branch at number four and JL Skinner at number five. And the whole time I just had like my hands up in the air, just like, I don't know, man. Um, but those are my five. Okay. Give me one second. Cause mine got messed up a little bit. I had mm -hmm. go ahead and say those again. Yeah. Jordan Sorry, battle. Out there. Yeah. Jordan battle is number one. Antonio Johnson is second. I have Jair Brown third, Brian branch out of Alabama at four and JL Skinner fifth, uh, to round out my top five at safety. And it was, it was, it was like a, it was like a soup, man. It was almost like picking names out of a hat. I think Jordan battle sort of went out just because of, uh, again, sort of how steady of a player he is with a pretty good frame, nothing that scares you. So, and again, we are talking safety. So that sort of won out the day. Uh, we talked about how Antonio Johnson has a good profile, but sort of his best play was in the slot and he doesn't really profile at that in the NFL. So there's some question about how that'll translate. Jair Brown is like the coach's favorite that fans will underappreciate, but there's athletic question marks there. Brian Branch, I think we'll talk about. I just kind of have him as like a do it all, but not sure where he fits best. Is there one place you can put him and he's going to excel? Is he just a jack of all, master of none type of player in the secondary without a great frame? And then JL Skinner, sort of boom or bust, really big, um, agile, quicker than you think, but that comfort that you see downfield, kind of hit and miss. Uh, when it comes to playing the ball well, and that's a bit scary at safety. Okay. 
So technical difficulties have been resolved. I have my I have Brian Branch at number one, Sidney Brown at number two, Jordan Battle at three, Jamie Robinson at four, and Antonio Johnson at five. Ooh. So pretty pretty different lists here. Um, Brian Branch, I guess let's start there. You you had him at four. I have him at four. Yep. Yeah. So I have him at one. You know, I think when you're talking about skill sets in this class there are really none that I'm like, this is a guy that is going to be a, a net positive on my defense. Like, I, I don't really think there's any guy that I'm going to plug in and be like, yep, he's a positive. I don't have to worry about that. I think Branch might be that only guy because we might be able to put him at slot corner. We might be able to put him at free safety. We might be able to put him at strong safety at times. So because of that, where I put him, I'm probably putting him in a position to be successful because of that flexibility. Um, I like what he does in terms of just his ability to be a magnet to the football, no matter where it is, he's finding a way to get there. Uh, he comes downhill fast. He takes great angles, things that I want in a safety, but no, I don't love him. And I, I just don't love anybody in this class, but why did you have him so much farther down your list? I like, I like certainty with where I can put my guys. Not that I dislike versatility, but I like being able to go, if nothing else, okay, yes, this guy is my strong safety, deep half safety, whatever you want to call it, and I'm comfortable there. With Branch, it's just his his profile, his size profile, I guess, more than anything else, just worried me because I think – I'm not sure he holds up at, at safety, right? He's 5'11", 195 pounds. He's, he's got corner tape but or corner size – with sort of that safety athleticism. And I always prefer the other way around. I want safety size with corner athleticism. So it's more like good football player, but the physical profile is the inverse of what you'd want to see. And that just brought him down the list for me. Okay. So Sidney Brown, I had at my number two spot. Uh, one of the better prospects in the safety class in terms of, I think he can play a legitimate safety position in the NFL on every snap and be okay. Um, he's, he's a good cover guy. He, he, he had some elite production. His grading was great. Uh, his athletic numbers were okay. So I liked him, but you didn't have him on your list at all. I didn't. And I, I like his tape too, but he's, and maybe it's just the height, I don't know, five ten safety. That's not super dynamic. The testing was pretty, was, was pretty good. And I, I kind of like his, his penchant for plays, uh, maybe it's just the profile that really knocked him down the list for me because I, I do like him. I like him, but uh, I don't know, man, a, a, 5'10, a 5'10 safety that isn't isn't Bob Sanders. <laughs> um, it, it's just going to knock you down. It's just that simple. Could he be one of the top five players from this class when it's all said and done at safety? Oh, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Wouldn't shock me. I totally get why you have him on your list. Uh, it's, it's just not what I'm looking for. 5'10", 2'11", is just not what I'm looking for. I, I would have put that guy at running back five years ago when he was entering college, so what do <laughs> I know, right? Right, and and Jordan Battle, I think, is the opposite, right? He is what you look for size-wise. We spoke about him a lot the other day. You have him as your number one, though. What separates him from the rest of the group? <laughs> the fact that <laughs> that his, he actually looks like a safety and is built like one where most of these other guys really aren't. Um, it's just steady Eddie, you know, it's, at this point it's a, um, it's slow and steady wins the race at safety, right? It's, it's, everybody has something that scares me except him. He has nothing that wows me, but he has nothing that scares me. So give me the guy that I'm not scared to put on the field and that I'm going to be comfortable with. And if he's just a 6.5 out of 10 starter for seven or eight years, that's perfectly fine with me. I'm not drafting him in the first uh, two rounds, so that works. Is there any other guys at the safety position you want to play <laughs> something about? No, absolutely okay. not. Um, not at all. <laughs> cool. Me neither. <laughs> um, so that's it. We wrapped up the defense. So, uh, again, this is a really good group of, of defensive players. I think it's the strength of this class, especially when you're talking about edge rusher and corner. Those are probably elite groups of players compared to previous years. Uh, we like some of the talent at defensive interior. We like the top guys at linebacker, and we're not going to say anything about safety. But um, tomorrow we are going to try to do 
a mock draft with at all 22 underscore Bobby. Have some fun doing that. And uh, we'll give you our breakdown of the Aaron Rodgers trade probably as well. <laughs> Something, again, I don't really want to talk about right now. Uh, but that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at all22 underscore PFF. And leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcast. And thanks for tuning in. Enter Jordan Love. Enter Jordan Love. I must go.